Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session Why Theory Matters, New Arguments for an Old Conclusion. This session is part of the Research Transparency Campaign, whose goal is to increase awareness of pre-registration and other open research practices necessary to ensure transparency in the research workflow. This campaign is organized by the Erasmus Research Institute of Management with Lizette Guzman Ramirez, the Erasmus University Library with Mussolini Nadimi, and Erasmus Research Services, myself. My name is Antonio Schettino, and I'm coordinator of open science at Erasmus Research Services. Among the things that I do, I develop educational and training materials on open science for students, researchers, and support staff. And I also directly support researchers in implementing open science in their workflow. So if you want to open up your projects, just send me an email and I'll do my best to help. Also, please consider joining the Open Science Community Rotterdam, where researchers and support staff help each other in learning, discussing, and adopting open science practices. For more information, um, there will be a link in the chat. In today's session, we'll talk about the importance of theoretical analysis as a valuable mechanism to evaluate and criticize theories with minimal plausibility, which can also help avoid waste of resources. Our invited speaker is Josue Baggio, professor of psycholinguistics at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Norway. His research focuses on computational and electrophysiological aspects of human language processing, learning, and transmission, with a focus on semantics. He also has a background in philosophy, logic, and cognitive neuroscience, which I guess will be particularly evident in today's talk. Uh, in a recent paper, he discusses how fostering the generation of strong theories can address critical issues in the current replication crisis or credibility crisis um, in several disciplines. We will put the link in the chat. So before giving the floor to our speaker, a few reminders. Please keep your microphone muted during the session. Video is optional, uh, although in case you want, you are more than welcome to turn it on so that the speaker does not you know, like see just like an empty space. Uh, and if you have questions, there are two ways to ask them. After the talk, click on the raise hand button and we will give you the floor so that you can ask the question yourself. Or you can write down your question in the chat and after the presentation, I will read it on your behalf. That's it from me. Josue, thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. So let me see if I can uh, share my screen and let me know if things are not looking the way they're supposed to. Um, so and thanks again for the invitation and, and thanks um, everyone for being here. Um, so the, as you may know, there is an ongoing discussion in the meta science community on theory and especially on theory in psychology. Um, psychology seems to have a problem with theory in the sense that our theories are said to be informal and weak. Uh, they rarely make precise testable predictions. Uh, they rarely provide mechanistic explanations. And here in this talk, I want to take a step back from this debate and ask the question why theory matters in the first place, um, especially for disciplines that rely strongly on statistical hypothesis testing. So what's the value of theory? Um, well, one traditional answer uh, builds on a specific view of scientific theories as formal inferential systems, right? Um, so these are systems that allow us to represent aspects of reality, say its cost structure, to explain phenomena, to predict observations and measurements, to compare models, and so on. Now, it then follows that weak, uh, absent, or latent theories, so theories that are not made fully explicit, uh, reduce our capacity to make valid inferences to and from data. So you might have the most awesome ideas in the world, but a good theory is supposed to tell us what follows also empirically from, um, from those ideas. So theories do the inferential work for us. Now, so I find this argument rationally convincing. Um, but I also think that it does not encourage researchers to engage in theory building. So if we can generate results and publish our papers with little or no background theory, uh, why bother about theory at all? Well, in this talk, I will try to give you just one uh, very good reason why we should bother. Um, so if we ask what we as empirical researchers quote unquote, fear the most, then many of us would probably say false reports, right? So now there are two types of false reports. And here throughout the talk, I will be assuming that researchers are honest and unbiased. 
uh, false negative reports, which are of course bad in many areas of applied science. So say if we are not able to detect and to report threats, say cancer in a patient or a new virus in a population or say a tsunami approaching the coastline, then we cannot avoid the harmful consequences of these events, right? So false negative reports are bad because undetected harm is bad. Uh, but I would say in basic science, false positive reports are actually much worse. For example, because they imply more false hypotheses in what we may call stacking, um, because they can misdirect research programs and entire fields, and because eventually they fail replication leading to confidence or credibility crisis. Um, but what are false positive reports exactly? How can we define them? And most important, how can we keep them in check? And what does theory have to do with this? Um, some of you will be familiar with the formal definition of the false positive report probability, but I'll go through it for those of you who aren't. So we need to introduce uh, the usual standard concepts here. Um, namely the prior probability that the hypothesis that we are testing is true, which um, we can call pi. Um, the type 1 error probability or rate, uh, alpha, so the probability of getting a positive result when the hypothesis is in, is in fact false, uh, false positive. The type 2 error, which is the false negative, we call beta. Uh, the probability of obtaining a negative result when the hypothesis we are testing is in fact true, and power, which is standardly defined as 1 minus beta, namely the probability of getting a positive result when the hypothesis is true. Now, we define the false uh, positive report probability as the probability that the hypothesis is false, um, when we have obtained a positive finding and note that this is different from the alpha, right? So um, we can use Bayes' theorem to uh, flesh this out and what we get is uh, that this probability is the type 1 error, namely alpha, multiplied by the probability, the prior probability that the hypothesis under test is false, so 1 minus pi, um, divided by the probability of a positive result. And we need to do a bit of work in order to figure out what this is exactly. So we can calculate that by using the relationship between conditional and joint probabilities, and we get to the definition of the, of the uh, denominator here, and we can plug that in in the FPRP definition, and this is what we get. Um, so we can rewrite the FPRP definition as a reciprocal function, which I think is a much nicer and easier to remember way, where the uh, denominator has power divided by alpha multiplied by the odds ratio uh, plus one. Um, note that three variables affect uh, FPRP. So the type one error, alpha, the type 2 um, error, beta or power, 1 minus beta, and the prior probability of the hypothesis on the test time. So that's really important because it's, I think, a vastly underappreciated fact that uh, our ability to control uh, false positive reports depends on these three factors and not just on our ability to keep type 1 and type 2 errors in check. So we'd like to think that if we can control type 1 and type 2 errors, then we also control FPRP, but pi cannot be ignored either. Now you could say, why should I care? Um, the prior odds for my hypothesis are 50-50, right? Can be either true or false. So if I minimize type one and type two error probabilities, say I uh, use a conservative alpha threshold and I have high power in my study, then by definition, by the FPRP equation, uh, FPRP would be minimized too. Again, assuming no bias and so on. Um, so if you plug these values in, in the formula, uh, say for alpha at 0.005 and power at 0.8, um, you get that the um, um, false positive report probability is indeed very small, 0.006. Now, but this actually only works if the prior odds really are 50-50. And I would suggest that this is an over-optimistic assumption to make. Let's see why. <clears throat> 
Um, so first, a hypothesis can indeed be true or false, but that does not make uh, the prior odds 50-50 necessarily. So if you actually have more information about your hypothesis, you cannot really apply the principle of indifference here. Second, we need to think carefully about what prior probabilities are. So they may be degrees of belief in your hypothesis, and then they range from zero to one, uh, based on local data, say evidence from prior experiments, or the wider web of belief in which your study is embedded, um, which may include your field and also neighboring fields. But pi may also be the ratio of true hypothesis to tested hypothesis. And this is where things get uh, difficult. For example, in genome-wide association studies, right, the researcher might assume that one to five out of 50,000 to 250,000 functional gene variants um, contribute to a disease or condition. And then the prior probability, your pi value, is actually very small. So it lies somewhere between 0 0.0001 and 0 0.0001. So we cannot just assume that um, um, pi is 0.5 just because a hypothesis can be true or false. Pi can be very small for a variety of reasons. And that's the case at least whenever we are using big data. So we have, for example, similar problems in neuroimaging where we are running a massive number of, of multiple tests and multiple comparisons. Now, the fact that we overlook how small pi can in fact be has been cited as one of the reasons behind low replication rates in psychology. Um, Alexander Bird, in one of my favorite recent papers, so that's published in the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, um, has argued that high FPRP and therefore low replication rates um, can be compatible and even characteristic of high quality science if there is a high share of false hypotheses that are tested and if there is uh, insufficient type 1 um, error control, say your alpha is not small enough. Um, there is actually empirical evidence that pi is low in psychology, so one estimate, so that's a study by Johnson and colleagues that takes into account some forms of publication bias, sets it around 0.1. Uh, there is, of course, evidence of low replication rates in some areas of psychology, and also that current statistical practices are insufficient to control for type 1 and type 2 error rates. So what are possible solutions? Well, we either become more skeptical of published results, which I don't think really is a solution, just trusting each other less, uh, or we reform um, psychological methodologies, say by adopting more effective measures to control for type 1 and type 2 errors. Or, and that's my favorite solution, um, together with two, that we try to reduce FPRP by increasing pi, meaning generating hypotheses that are more likely to be true. And this is where I think theory becomes relevant again. But let's first look at proposals for methodological reform. Can they really reduce the probability of false positive reports? Um, a common reform proposal is to increase statistical power, for example, using larger samples. Um, and here I'm showing FPRP as a function of pi um, for three different values of power, two of which are estimates based on the literature that I cite at the bottom of the page. So the dotted line is current average power in cognitive neuroscience, 0.35, not very good. The dashed line is current average power in some areas of psych psychology and biomedicine, around 0.5, a bit better. And the continuous line is the 1992 recommendation by Cohen of 0.8 power. And I assume alpha at 0.05 in all cases. Now you see that even large differences in power um, actually move the curve only by little. If your pi is actually 0.1, then the gains in reducing FPRP by increasing power are actually not huge. Um, what if we lower alpha to 0.005, as um, um, people have recently proposed? Um, and again, assuming that power stays around 0.5. Now we see clearer gains, right? FPRP is much smaller, even for low values of pi, so even for pi at around 0.1. And of course, if we combine the two solutions, then the gains are even larger. 
Uh, we could imagine a reformed psychology where alpha is at 0.005 and power conforms to Cohen's recommendation at 0.8. Um, this would actually bring psychology somewhat closer to current statistical standards of particle physics. And, and you see that even if you're testing hypotheses that have low prior probability, your FPRP is low enough. So methodological reform can work. It is important. So increasing power and redefining significance can reduce FPRP. However, not for uh, extreme values of, of, of pi, of prior probability. So this is something that we need to focus on here. For extreme values of pi, uh, power and significance have no effect on FPRP, which tends to zero whenever pi tends to one, and tends to one whenever pi tends to zero. And I call this case the pi trap when pi is very small. Um, and in this case, no reform proposal works. Just FPRP is uh, uh, shooting through and getting to one, uh, no matter what you do for uh, low values of pi. Uh, we should also be wary that reform, if we also do not address pi, can actually worsen known problems. For example, Mayo's paradox, roughly that if you're testing only hypotheses that make uh, directional predictions, and you increase power, you will very often be able to reject the null hypothesis of no effect. So you will keep detecting effects that are small, subtle, but not very meaningful. And you will, in fact, lower your chances of uh, rejecting theories. Um, another kind of paradoxical finding is that uh, the FPRP function gets very nonlinear for a reformed science for low values of, P of pi. So this means that we have to be able to control um, the fact that small differences in pi can lead to huge differences in, in FPRP. So we need to have ways of estimating pi very precisely and knowing very accurately where we are in the pi dimension. And this, depend this dependency is actually more graceful for unreformed science, which is uh, quite an uh, ironic advantage. So there are paradoxes that need to be addressed and pi and the pi trap problem doesn't go away. So how do we escape the pi trap? How to avoid hypotheses that have low prior probability? Um, it has been argued that we need to state and understand um, prior beliefs in the hypothesis we are testing. And this is you and it is on the left here, that we should evaluate carefully the existing evidence before we run a study. Um, and that we should try to generate higher quality hypotheses, hypotheses with greater prior probability. Um, so this is um, Alexander Bird on, on the bottom here. And I tend to agree with, with Bird's uh, conclusion that what we need is really higher quality hypotheses that stand a better chance of turning out true uh, after testing. And I think we need to focus debates on theory and psychology exactly on this, namely escaping the pie trap. And note that we cannot do that empirically. So Karl Popper and others recommended that we test bold ideas and learn from how they fail. But I'm not sure that would actually work, especially in the state psychology is in right now. So testing our way of the pie trap is not really an option. Uh, in a reformed science, we would end up with too few positive results. Uh, the lower alpha threshold will, of course, be doing its work. Or when we do get positive results with a high ratio of false to true positives, so at IFPRP. So the solution is, I think, non-empirical, and the many proposals that I've seen so far all seem to point in the direction of theory. Um, but we don't just need more theory, so you sometimes hear that psychology needs more theory. No, because hypotheses with lower prior probability could also follow from theories that are well designed to work as formal inferential systems, right? So we need specific dedicated guarantees for that. So we need better theories, sure, theories with the virtues that are solicited by traditional arguments, so theories that are formal, representational, explanatory, predictive, and so on. Uh, but good theories should also be aimed by design at screening out low pi hypotheses. And this is the new view that I'm beginning to argue for here. <clears throat> 
So this is what uh, Iris Van Roy and I have argued in a couple of recent papers. Uh, we do, of course, accept that theory should be formal if it is to serve as an inferential system. Um, also, we believe that the traditional empirical cycle in which hypotheses are tested and theory is refined is important, but is not the only way a theory could move forward. So we argue that theory should be forth, further developed in what we call the theoretical cycle, uh, where aspects of the theory, including the models that it generates, the empirical hypothesis that it entails, are evaluated for uh, a priori plausibility, what we call very similitude. So in my field, for example, in cognitive science, um, we can specify the functions that are computed by the system, say mapping inputs to outputs, sentences to interpretations, and we would then narrow down the final set of candidates of functions describing real world capacities by applying certain plausibility constraints that the system must satisfy. For example, computability or the tractability of the relevant function, mapping inputs to outputs, its learnability, its evolvability, compatibility with the relevant substrates, in this case, neurobiology, and so on. Um, so the theoretical cycle is meant to ensure that the theory has minimal a priori plausibility. And this is, of course, a condition for empirical hypotheses that are derived from the theory to also be minimally plausible, that is, outside the pie trap. Um, constraints on the plausibility of theories are different in different fields and they form an open set um, and constraints evolve as the field evolves. So in my own field, psycholinguistics, for example, computability and learnability were very prominent um, at, in the early days of the field and today tractability and evolvability um, are more prominent and um, this is what people tend to focus on a bit more. Um, but what I want to convey here is that you will need to think about which constraints actually apply to your own field and your own problem. So to conclude some take home messages, um, the low probability of the hypothesis we are testing pi is a real problem and it is a hard problem. And we should take it seriously uh, just as we take seriously type one and type two error control. Uh, methodological reform is important and useful, but it is not sufficient. Uh, it is ineffective for very low values of pi, and it is actually unnecessary for high values of pi. Um, so running more e experiments and testing bolder ideas, um, so finding a way out of the pi trap through the empirical cycle doesn't actually work. So for low values of pi, we would get too many false positive reports for unreformed science or actually too few, few positive reports for uh, the versions of reformed science that I discussed uh, in the talk. So rather, we need to reconsider the role of theory uh, in what Iris and I have called the theoretical cycle, for example. Um, the argument is that we need careful, formal and systematic plausibility analysis where we identify and discard low probability hypotheses before they are tested. So in this way, we reduce the risks and also the costs of pursuing false or even impossible empirical claims. And we also lay a better foundation for uh, reproducible science. So traditional arguments for theory um, as inferential system uh, must be used parsimoniously and critically. I believe, as I said at the beginning of the talk, that they are rationally convincing but they do not actually directly address the concerns that most empirical researchers have or should have, such as the problem of the low prior probability of hypothesis. So the hope is that we can develop new arguments for theory that would help researchers address basic problems in the way we do science today. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. And if you're interested in reading more, so these are the two papers that I co-author with Iris Van Roy, and we tend to alert people of new work uh, through Twitter. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So, I mean, the, 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 yeah, a testament to the fact that this was a very uh, thought-provoking uh, conversation is that now we have like uh, three questions in the chat and 
only three minutes. So I don't think we'll be able to, uh, yeah, to answer all of them. So I, I, I'm sorry, I have to overrule all of them because we have one question that we ask all um, uh, speakers. So it's better if I ask that first and then you know, we, can, we can continue the conversation. Um, so if you had to choose one open science practice that is necessary to ensure transparency in your field, what would it be? Well, the easy answer would be open data and open code, right? But I, I would say that based on what I said in my talk, that we need to find ways to improve transparency in the way we the way we generate hypotheses. So in the links between the theory and the things that we are testing, whether it's hypotheses or models. Um, and one way to do this would be to have shared theoretical frameworks where a bunch of people are working on and we know what are the hypotheses, we know how they are generated, which ones are worth testing and replicating and so on. So I think that theory is key also when it comes to transparency. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So now let's see, we've got uh, a little bit of time. Uh, David, would you like to uh, ask the question yourself or do you want me to read it? Uh, I'm happy to. Uh... Uh, ask it if I can find it again. Um, I guess I was wondering, and this may be a naive question, but um, so I think behavioural ecology, I think perhaps we actually have a, a very good, strong shared theoretical framework in many ways because it's based on um, uh, natural selection. So in many ways we do share, we do do a lot of what you just said actually, I think, in sharing um, hypotheses and, and, and things, although you then get trapped in fashion. Um, but I think one thing that behavioural ecology does struggle with um, are testing plausible alternatives, um, because there are multiple plausible solutions. You know, if you're trying to understand which male or female are in charge of mating dynamics, you know, there's it could be either, and there are plausible reasons for both. So, would 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 you be a, would you be this may be naive, but are you allowed to have multiple high pi hypotheses? Or by definition, there is only one high pi hypothesis, and the rest is the rest are low. And does that mean you should only test one? Yeah. No, I think it's easy to confuse truth as such with prior plausibility, right? And we might think that there is one true hypothesis, but that's still compatible with there being many um, hypotheses that have high prior plausibility. Right, so prior plausibility is just a measure of what we know and what we think might be the case, and that might not be correlated with truth at all. And it's important to uh, to distinguish the two, of course. If if we could control truth a priori, we wouldn't need to do any testing, right? So this is prior probability. It's actually a different concept. So of course you are allowed to have many hypotheses that have high pi, and this would be for the better, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Josue, uh, we know that you uh, have other obligations, but do you have time to uh, answer yeah. to your question? Sh sure, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you uh, it, it is quite a long question, so can you, can you make like a, a short <laughs> summary? It's, it's, it's not a, a question. Maybe it was more a comment, just uh, appreciation for the, uh, for the talk. Um, and I, um, I was just looking at your paper, so I'm very uh, eager to read them. And um, so I'm particularly interested in, in uh, what you nicely uh, explained in mathematical terms. How, how can we make sure that the, um, the basis for any hypothesis that is put forward is, is um, robust enough and credible enough and and I think a lot of uh, I share your concern that I think a lot of the theorizing also in business and management research in um, in particularly the more experimental traditions there's a lot of false positives there and there's a lot of concerns about the uh, the credibility of the the causal claims that are being put forward um, and and the fix is not methodological only or maybe even primarily it's partly about thinking again about the how theory fits into the picture um and in business and management research we have a pretty um as in psychology i i i like to think a pretty basic and and um understanding of theory and have neglected it and and hence why i really like what you're doing and how you're bringing uh, bringing this to the table again 
but in my view, uh, I'm more of a qualitative researcher. So for me, it's also important to make sure that the phenomenon is covered more carefully and conceptualized in different ways as, as basically the way towards getting towards the basis for putting any any hypothesis forward. And um, uh, so it's asking about, so one thing would be to ask these reverse causal questions. So a lot of research in organizational behavior, which is, is like applied psychology, just assumes that something is a root cause or a true cause from the outset where often without any any uh, good reasons, plausible reasons in your terms for that. Uh, so, um, so I think a lot is to be gained to also look beyond the propositional form and, and ask different types of questions, conceptualize phenomena more richly in, in more varied ways than, than we have been doing. So it's, it's more, um, yeah, now, now I'm rambling and taking the floor. I, I, it was not meant to be that way, but just lots of appreciation for your talk. So thank you. Thank you for the comment. I actually agree with it completely. Yes. Yeah, I think maybe what like a take home message uh, is that actually, you know, focusing more on, on theory generation and, you know, like the, the, the theoretical cycle can also help beyond uh, purely quantitative um, disciplines, you know, so see there's a more like a, uh, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't say domain agnostic, but you know, like it's, it's a broader uh, set of uh, reforms that, you know, like many disciplines can, uh, can, can benefit from. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, okay, so we're already <laughs> a little bit late, so um, that's it for today. So many thanks to, of course, to Josue for, uh, yeah, for, for yeah, giving us such a wonderful perspective. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us um, and for all the events on the Research Transparency Campaign. Uh, there is a link in the chat. So thank you all for your participation and yeah, enjoy your day and see you in future sessions. Thank you for having me. Bye.